The volcanic eruption off the south coast of Iceland that began on the 14th of November 1963 went on much longer than was ever expected. For the first month, it was an explosive eruption which built up a sizable island, Surtse. Then on the 4th of April, a lava eruption started in the younger of the two main craters on Surtse, and a thin flow of molten basalt built up a shield of ropey lava on the base of ashes and fragmented lava. And so the island continued to grow in spite of the fierce assaults of the ocean. At the boss of the shield, for more than 13 months, a pool of lava bubbled. But on the 17th of May, the fires went out in Surtse, which now covered an area of about one square mile. But about the same time, a submarine eruption started about 600 yards northeast of Surtse. And before long, a new island pushed up its head, Sietlingur. Its explosions were just like those of Surtse before it smaller at first, but gradually growing more violent. While the bombardment of lava fragments was at its height, no one was safe within 500 yards of the island. In the summer of 1965, timber was shipped out to Surtse. The idea being to put up a building for the convenience of scientists on a level patch of lava at the eastern end of the island. But Sietlinger upset this plan by pouring ash over everything and burying the foundations. The landscape on Surtse was now striking and it was hard to believe that the island was only in its second year. By September, Sjöplinger had grown to a height of more than 200 feet and an area of about 40 acres. 
Here we see it at the end of September. Three weeks later, the sea had washed it away. For a while now, things were quiet, and Sirtse was white with snow. Then, on Boxing Day of 1965, a new eruption was seen, about a thousand yards southwest of Sirtse. Here the island Yolnir, Christmas Island, was formed, but it had a hard struggle to survive. Five times during the winter, it was washed away by the waves, but with the coming of spring, it began to grow appreciably, and landing became possible. The frogman seen here swimming ashore looks black, but those who followed after him were soon as black as he was, for Yolnir was free with its ash. The crater cone of Yolnir is partly surrounded by a sunken valley into which, at high tide, the sea pours through the permeous walls of ash and scoria. But fascinating as Yolnir was, in the summer of 1966, the main object of scientific investigation was Sirtse itself. Landings were frequent, they're not always too easy. Work now began anew on building a hut, this time by the lagoon at the northern end of the island, for it wasn't practicable to put it on the old foundations where the sea had rolled large rocks. Yolnir behaved just like Tsirtlinga before it, showering ash over Sirtse and disturbing the kittiwakes that had settled on the western cliffs of the island. Sirtse was now of special interest to those biologists who wanted to see how life would establish itself on this new, once completely barren island and how it would thrive there. In some places, the stones on the shore had become completely coated with green algae. A log of decayed driftwood can hide various living creatures worth investigation, while birds must be watched, whether alive or dead. Bacteria are collected on special plates and by other devices that are set on posts all over the island. The first of the higher plants to take root on Sirtse was sea rocket. The next was shore lime grass but the ash fall hit them both. Meteorological instruments were installed on the island, while in the comfortable hut by the lagoon, scientists worked with seismographs and other instruments. On the 10th of August, 1966, Yolnir at last became silent and it was now possible to walk all over it, which was soon done. In the sunken valley surrounding the cone, there was a shallow lagoon with a view across it over the crater wall to Sirtse, while in the crater itself, there was a still pool 
quite warm. The sea was beginning to break down the southern wall of the crater, while the northern wall looked from the outside like the surface of the moon, pitted with holes made by the lava bombs which had fallen in the loose ash. Yolne has now been overwhelmed by the sea, but old Surtzer still had a few surprises up his sleeve for the scientists. On the 19th of August, 1966, after two and a half years of silence, a crack 240 yards long opened in the bottom of the crater. In this, three new lava craters appeared. Two of them proved short-lived, but from the third, a stream of lava was still flowing as the year ended. This lava was more basic, richer in olivine and thinner than that which had previously covered the southern part of Surtse, and it soon flowed to the sea. The battle between sea and fire began once more. By the end of September, there was nothing left of Yolnir but a shoal washed by the sea at high tide, where once there had been an island 200 feet high and 70 acres in area.
but the eruption on Circe still goes on. And on neighbouring islands, life, both animal and vegetable, is waiting, ready to colonise this new island of the North Atlantic.